describing uh, some of the patterns that we want to use with uh, doing test driven development using Jasmine, uh, which is a framework uh, for JavaScript TDD uh, put together by the guys over at Pivotal and is specifically intended uh, for Rubyists to use and integrate into your Ruby and or Rails apps. So I'm Chris Powers. I'm a software consultant for Optiva. Um, we are currently hiring, so if you're looking for a gig in Chicago or in Denver, let me know. But that aside, so I think the first question that we kind of have to tackle before we get into, you know, why do we want to try out the Jasmine library itself, is first of all, why do we want to test JavaScript in the first place? And I think it probably goes a little deeper to ask the question, well, why are we testing code, period? <coughs> Because if it's mine, it doesn't work. <laughs> so the first thing is that JavaScript is important. And frankly, it's getting more important every single day. And I've met several guys, uh, had conversations over the last couple days here, uh, who don't sound real happy about this. And unfortunately, it's not going away. Um, we can try to abstract it away using something like CoffeeScript. Uh, we tried to do something really clever called RJS. That went well. Um, but it's important, and the bottom line is that the, the clients that we work for, the businesses, are going to continue to look for deeper, richer, uh, more interactive experiences through the web. JavaScript is everywhere. Not only is it the language that we're going to be using to build out the client sides of our web apps, but now we've got JavaScript on the server, if we're using something like Node or Ringo. And now we're even getting JavaScript in our databases. If you've been using Mongo, if you've been using Couch, you're very familiar with the fact that uh, it's um, in the internals, it's using JavaScript. And you're writing a lot of your queries or your views in JavaScript. Now, one of the biggest problems is that while well, JavaScript is hard, and that's true. I think that um, you know JavaScript has become one of the I think most misunderstood languages um, and that is still being used all the time. Um, and I think because of that, um, a lot of times we try to take JavaScript and turn it into something that it's not. Whether it's a library like Prototype, making it very Ruby-ish, um, or, or something along those lines, We're trying to make it object-oriented when it's not strictly an object-oriented language. Things like that. But this is probably the biggest complaint that I hear from people when we start talking about uh, doing testing for JavaScript. And they say, well, it seems like a lot of work just for some lousy regression tests. And if that's the criteria, I would actually agree. Because when it comes down to it, whatever JavaScript that you have in your app, it's, it may not be too hard to just start clicking through and do your testing that way. Do some regression testing just by clicking through. Maybe you have a QA team. Maybe you're lucky enough to have some people who can do this as their day job. And having automated tests may not seem like uh, that big of a deal. But the thing is that that's not what TDD is about. Doing test room <coughs> development is not just about building out a regression test suite. It's about guiding your development so the first thing that it does is it drives good design in your code. Specifically in your JavaScript code, you're going to find that it's going to become a little more object-oriented er. <laughs> because it's not object-oriented. There's objects, and I think it gets oriented er. But I guess what I mean by that is simply the fact that you're going to end up with code that is more modular and is more namespaced, which is more important in JavaScript than a lot of other languages. Uh, because of how JavaScript deals with global variables and things. Uh, modules, namespaces are very important. <coughs> You're going to end up with code that is much more flexible. It's going to be easier to update, easier to modify, and extend over time. And you're going to end up with code that is reusable, both within the same project and then across projects. And those are all benefits of using modular design. Now, why is it that writing tests, and specifically test driving your uh, development. Why? How does that get you here? Well, the bottom line is that you can't test something without a name. You can't test something that you can't make a reference to in your tests. And so, you know, when you're doing your jQuery code and you've got 
nested function inside of a nested function inside of a nested function, and they're all anonymous, and it's all slick-looking jQuery. Well, the problem is you can't test that. And that's one of the big problems that people have, is they're like, well, I can't <coughs> test this, so I'm not going to. Test driving your JavaScript demands that you take a new, fresh look at how you're writing your JavaScript. Focus and process. These are some of the benefits of using test-driven development as well. The code that you write is going to be driven by the business requirements. It's not just going to be code that you're writing on a whim, uh, or you know, there's going to be a very, uh, a very strict set of business requirements that you get from your users or from your client, and you're going to iteratively work through those, writing tests, writing implementation, and following that red-green refactor pattern. If you're not familiar with that, the pattern is basically that red means that you've written a test that is failing. That's always where you start. You have taken a business expectation and you have written code that expresses that requirement and that expectation. And you see it fail because it's not done yet. It's not um, implemented. You then go in and you write as little code as possible to get that test to change, to uh, pass. And that's green. And now refactoring is just that continual set of iterative changes that you're making to the internals of your code, making improvements, simplifying your code that doesn't actually affect the exterior behavior or the API of the code. And when we get into that red-green refactor, red-green refactor, iterative development cycle, we start to get focused and we see process. You also know when you're done. You know, a lot of times when you're working on a feature and there's really kind of vague requirements, you don't really know when you're done. There ends up being a lot of round trips in between you and the client or you and your business partners. Nobody's exactly sure when it's done. But using TDD, we do know because once you're done with those business requirements, once you've written that last test, it's time to move on to something else. You also get some, what I call, free documentation. And for those of you who are using RSpec, and I hope that most of you <coughs> all of you are, um, you're already familiar with some of the benefits of this free documentation. So our specs that we write, they are going, assuming that they're good specs, they're going to be expressing the object behavior of the objects that we're writing. And when we run our test suite, we're going to have legible output that is going to be very descriptive. It's going to kind of read like documentation and tell us what these objects and what these systems do. And these can be very helpful tools for when you have new developers who need to get up to speed on a project. They're able to go straight to the tests, to your specs. They're able to see how you are using these objects and what requirements you are putting on these objects. And it becomes a very expressive way of getting up to speed. Oh, yeah. Plus, you get a regression test suite. And I guess the way that I've been looking at recently is that this is almost just a side effect of all of the other benefits that we get when we go about our Ruby code, our JavaScript code, or whatever other languages we're using, taking a test-driven development approach to that. So why is it that we actually want to use Jasmine? Because there are a lot of JavaScript uh, frameworks out there. Uh, there's, and they're good ones, too. You know, you've got uh, Funk Unit, Screw Unit. Uh, we've got uh, Blue Ridge, and there's you know, a, a series of them. So what is it about Jasmine specifically that I decided would be a good thing to share today? Well, one of the biggest things is that if you are already familiar with RSpec, you're already familiar with Jasmine because they flat out ripped off RSpec. And it's a great thing that they did because it's to all of our benefit. They both have a very similar syntax. They both take that BDD approach, that behavior-driven development approach to uh, describing behavior of objects. And they also end up with very similar output, which like I mentioned before, doubles as this kind of documentation. So the RSpec integration is very tight. First of all, if you're already using RSpec and you have that spec directory, uh, it's going to drop a JavaScript directory into your spec directory, and that's where all your Jasmine specs are going to go. And if you're hopefully using something uh, like Hudson or Cruise Control, using some continuous integration on your team to make sure that you always have a good build, uh, Jasmine is out of the box ready to plug into that as well, along with your Q 
cucumber tests, your RSpec tests, or whatever else you're using. One other cool feature that has been uh, added recently uh, to RSpec is that when we're working with Jasmine uh, and really any JavaScript tests, one of the things that you oftentimes have to do is you need to load in some fixture data. All right, now not like RSpec where you're loading in stuff from the database, but rather um, some fixture markup that you pull into your code. Um, you then run behavior on this markup and you know, make sure that your expectations are being met. And one of the cool things that RSpec supports now is that if you're using RSpec tests, controller tests that have the view integration turned on so that they are actually running the controller action and generating the view, it will actually take the output from the view and it will write it to disk. It'll save it tucked away in your TMP file. And when you run your Jasmine specs later, Jasmine will look in your temp directory, find these saved uh, markup files, and actually use them. And so the great thing about that is that if you make a change to your view that, and, and you forgot to make a similar change to your JavaScript files, you're going to see a test failure because it's going to load in that view, it's going to run the JavaScript, and it's going to fail because of this change, and you're going to find out immediately that you need to update your JavaScript. Getting up and running with Jasmine is surprisingly easy to do. It's about two steps. You just install the uh, Jasmine gem, and then there's a Rails generator uh, that you can run, and that will create a file uh, like this. It's a, a Jasmine YAML configuration file. Basically, it just allows you to specify, these are all of the JavaScript files that I want, uh, my source files that I want to include so, so that I can run tests against them. Uh, here's even style sheets that I want to include in case that affects the way that the JavaScript works. And then here's where I store all of my spec JavaScript files. And these are the orders that I want everything to be pulled in. Now, there's two ways that you can actually run your Jasmine specs. One of them, and I think it's the, it's the faster and the easier way, is that you can actually run this in the browser, which is pretty sweet. Um, you just run rig Jasmine, and that starts up a uh, spec server on port 8888. And when you go to that in your browser, this is what you get. And you can see that of all these specs that I had, we had one failure, and the rest of them were passing. And when I make changes, all I then have to do is refresh the browser, and I can see the updated tests. And these run very, very fast. I mean, it's usually, I don't know, a tenth of a second to run a couple hundred of these things. I mean, they're, when you take the database out, it's pretty blazing. Now, using the browser has some definite problems with it. And one of the big ones is that, well, I want to run it from the command line, right? That's probably what a lot of you are thinking. And I want to integrate this into my CI system. I can't integrate a browser into my CI system. And so Jasmine also gives you rake Jasmine CI, which is going to run them on the command line um, in a way that you can integrate into your CI system, and uh, it'll run the specs from the command line. Uh, in the background, it's going to be using Selenium uh, in order to run these things. And so it does take longer uh, to do Jasmine CI than just running them in the browser, but this is going to uh, you know, be a good solution for those times uh, when you need that flexibility. Chris, there's a lot of work going on trying to get other support for headless um, JavaScript testing. Mm -hmm. you know, using, you know, there's like eight different things that are being worked at right now sure. for how to do headless testing of that, so that you can get Selenium out of the picture. Yes. Yeah. There's um, there's some really really cool development. I think I just saw a library called Phantom. I think. Yeah. Where, um, yeah and there's yeah. So there is a lot of active development in this space, uh, which is really exciting to see where that's heading. So now at this point, I want to use RSpec as a point of comparison to show you what does Jasmine code actually look like. So let's get cooking. So first of all, all of our specs and our expectations are going to be grouped into these describe blocks. And so on the top, I'm going to be showing RSpec code. And on the bottom, I'm going to be showing the Jasmine code that is essentially equivalent. And at one quick glance, you can see that, yes, these are very similar. So Jasmine gives you a describe function where you pass in a string. Uh, you can't pass in an object, but you can pass in a string. Um, to describe, I want to describe this cook object, and I'm going to describe the process of baking a pie. 
And now inside of these described blocks, I'm going to have uh, the actual examples or the expectations in uh, it blocks or it functions in JavaScript. And so what I'm able to do here is I can say it should be tasty, passing in an arbitrary string uh, that describes this expectation. And then inside of this anonymous passing function, uh, I'm able to run code and then set an expectation. So now in our spec, the way that we set our expectations is that we're given the should method on all of our objects. Um, and we can then use matchers or we can use operators uh, in order to actually uh, set that pi.tasty dot should be true, setting that expectation. So in Jasmine, we have one function, expect, that actually sets up an expectation, as opposed to our spec, which has a few should, should not, uh, should receive, things like that. Um, Jasmine always uses expect. And you pass expect some kind of a value. In this case, my value is going to be the, uh, the tasty attribute of pi. And then I'm going to use a matcher function uh, in order to actually put that expectation on. Now, what exactly is this truthy stuff about? Why didn't we just say expired the pi that tasty to be true or to be false? Well, and the reason has to do with how JavaScript as a language um, actually evaluate certain statements. There's a few quirks that you need to be aware of, and I think this is why um, they specifically chose to use the words to be truthy and to be falsy. So up top we have the actual uh, master definition of to be truthy. And you'll see what's happening is it's taking, uh, so this dot actual is what's passed in, and we're just evaluating that and uh, inverting it twice to get uh, an evaluated value which is all well and good except for these anomalies down here. So expect the string below to be truthy. You know, that's true um, because th that string is going to evaluate to true. But in JavaScript, a blank string actually evaluates to false, which is totally different from how it works in Ruby and probably most other languages. Uh, similarly, you know, one, two, three, that's going to evaluate to true, but the number zero actually evaluates to false. So this is just a reminder of some of those quirks that it's more about evaluating truthiness than strictly uh, whether it evaluates the true or not. So now if you want to do negative expectations using uh, our spec, if we needed to say that you know, I should not be burned, um, then rather than using should, we simply use the should not method and then use the matcher. In Jasmine, Again, we're just sticking with the expect function, but now we're able to chain on the not method in there in order to simply uh, you know, reverse the value uh, returned by um, this matcher to be burned. So we've seen a couple of these Jasmine matchers, uh, to be truthy, to be falsy, uh, those are built in. I'd say there's about a dozen or so built in uh, matchers uh, for the most common cases. But if you want to be more expressive in your test, you want to do something like, you know, expect it not to be burned, how do we do that? So in both our spec and in Jasmine, you're able to create custom matchers. And so in our spec, we get this spec matchers define method. We pass in a uh, symbol for the method name, and then we get this match block where we have the actual object, and that actual object represents what is actually being tested. And so we can check that, check the color, see if it's black, return a value based on that. So now in Jasmine, a little different syntax, but it's the same idea. We're going to uh, use the this.addMatchers function, and we can actually pass in an object with as many of these matchers as we want. Uh, each key in this object is going to be the name of the matcher, and then each value is going to be a function. And inside of that function, you get the this.actual object that we can then uh, run different expectations on. The only thing we have to remember is that we have to explicitly return because it's not going to implicitly return the way it does in Ruby. So now you see in this Jasmine example, we're using before each. So in our spec, we get the before each and the after each blocks. 
Um, this is nested inside of a describe block. And basically, this allows us to do setup and tear down code uh, in before and after every single it um, every single it block that's inside of that description. And so we have something very similar uh, in Jasmine. We have the before each and the after each methods. Um, the one gotcha that we need to take a look at here is you'll notice that in the RSpec, I was able to just create the pi variable inside of that before each. And that pi instance variable would be available in the after each in all subsequent describes and it blocks. Now, the way the JavaScript scoping works, we don't get uh, quite as much of that metaprogramming magic to make that happen. And so instead, what we need to do is we need to actually declare the variable outside of the scope of the before each. And then we can set the value inside before each. Because if we had actually declared the variable inside of the before each block, it would be stuck in there. We wouldn't see that outside of the scope. Now, before all and after all, that's something that is supported um, in our spec. And this is just run once before or after a set of uh, expectations. And in Jasmine, uh, we actually don't need a special construct for that. We can literally just run code before a describe block and run code after a describe block, and we get the, uh, basically the same functionality out of that. So one of the things that really, I think, makes Jasmine stand out above some of the other libraries is how we are able to stub our values and we're able to do message expectations very similarly to how our spec does it. So in this scenario, uh, we want to make sure that uh, if a pi is 160 degrees, that it considers itself done baking. And so we accomplish this in our spec by creating pi. We're going to stub out the temperature method. And then we're going to chain on and return so that we can return uh, 160 degrees. And then we can run the done baking method and assert that it should be true because that's our, our cooking temperature. Now, this is where Jasmine and our spec start to, uh, start to kind of branch off one another. And so Jasmine is able to do this exact same uh, behavior with a little bit of a different style. What it uses are called spy objects. And so a spy object is basically a, an object that when you use spy on, I'm going to spy on an object, and then you pass in the name of the method or the attribute that you want to sub out. And what's going to happen is that uh, Jasmine is actually going to take the method that you have that temperature method, and it's going to pull it out, and it's going to replace it with a spy object. And that spy object can then do your bidding. And so when that spy object gets called, I'm then able to do something like and return 160, and I get that stubbed value. Uh, and so while it's a little different syntax, and it's a little different under the hood, um, these are equivalently the same, the R spec and Jasmine. So now in R spec, um, sometimes stubbing is not enough. We want to make sure that a certain method is called. And so to do that, we would use the should receive. Say that, uh, okay, so this cook should be baking a pie for dinner. Cook should receive the bake a pie message. And we set that basically before it happens. We then do cook, make dinner, and, we and then basically we check to see if that expectation um, is met. Now again, we're going to use a spy in Jasmine, and the, uh, the syntax is the same for spying on this, uh, the same as stubbing. We're replacing that bake pie method with our spy object. Now here's, and this makes a little more sense in Jasmine, frankly, the fact that we actually run the method that we're interested in, which is cook.make dinner. And then we can put the expectation after, as opposed to having to say what should happen in the future, the way that we do with our spec. Jasmine allows us to actually look back and see what happened in the code preceding, which I think can be a little more legible. And so here we can actually place <coughs> an expectation on cook.bakepy, which remember cook.bakepy is now returning a spy object, not the original method. And that spy object you can now do expectations on. So the spy knows whether or not it has been called. And so we're able to use the to have been called uh, 
matcher in order to make that expectation. So taking that one step further, we don't want to just make a pie, we want to make a tasty pie. And so in our spec, I'm going to say that it should receive the bake pie message and it should receive it with the argument tasty. And I'm able to just chain on the with method there to specify that expectation. And we have something very similar in Jasmine. All we need to change is that we can change the to have been called matcher. We can then use the to have been called with and pass in any number of arguments that we're expecting. Now a cool uh, Jasmine only feature that our spec, as far as I understand, doesn't support is actually being able to call through to the original method. So let's say that we want to make sure that something uh, has been called and it has been called with a certain argument, but we also still want it to run. Maybe it makes the test easier to use or you know, maybe there's a significant original value that we still need to get out of that method. What we're able to do is when we spy on this cook uh, bake pie method, we can then use the and call through method. And that's actually going to retain a reference to the original function. The spy is going to be hit with the message. The spy is then going to delegate it on to the original function and return whatever the actual response is. And so I think that's actually, that is a really neat uh, Jasmine only piece of functionality that would be neat to see in our spec. I'm just not sure if it's possible based on how the languages differ. You can do it with double R. Double R allows that kind of uh, test doubling. Okay, using that as opposed to built in our spec. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. You might want to repeat. Yes, um, so apparently the double R, um, is that, that's a mocking library, right? Um, yeah, uh, so double R actually does support the functionality I was just talking about, which you can use inside of our spec rather than the built in our spec uh, mock library. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to uh, not only check to see that we received a message, but that we received a number of times. And so our spec gives you the nice sugary syntax where we can say that the cook should receive the check the pie message twice, because checking it once is not enough. We can do something similarly in Jasmine. And this time, uh, inside of our expect uh, function, we're using cook.checkThePie, which returns our spy. But now the spy actually has some attributes on it. And one of those attributes is the call count. And so you're actually able to ask the spy, well, how many times were you called? And we can then assert that it's going to equal two in order to get the same functionality. So now, expectations on errors uh, when you throw errors. So let's say that um, we have a cranky cook. And when we tell him to bake a pie, he's going to raise the air, make your own damn pie. <laughs> so if we want to test that, in our spec, we actually kind of have to jump through a little bit of a hoop here, right? Because we can't just raise an error inside of our git block. It's going to blow up our whole test suite. And so what we're able to do is we're able to use a lambda to create a scope where we can run the volatile code. And we can then actually put an expectation on that lambda. And we can say that, that lambda should raise the error, make your own damn pie. And with Jasmine, I think it's actually <coughs> it's cleaner the way that we can do it here uh, in JavaScript is that we can set this up. Uh, we have the, it's going to be a message, make your own damn pie. Um, and we can say that we expect uh, this method, the uh, cook.bakePie, to throw a given error message or a given error object or whatever you're using in JavaScript to represent your error. And so what to throw does is it will actually execute the cook.bakePy method, and then it will uh, put the expectation on whether or not uh, that threw an error that matches the message or object that you passed in. Finally, uh, <coughs> simulating errors. So getting a little more complex, now let's say that uh, Any time that we get one of these errors, we want to retry <coughs> with sudo. And so if our cook tells us to make our own damn pie, we will then use the sudo make a pie. And so uh, we're able to stub out the make pie method. And we're able to use the and raise uh, chain method in order to purposefully raise that when it's called. And then we can put on expectations 
about what should happen in the error handling code that that pseudo vega pi method would get called. And this too we can do in Jasmine. When we spy on the vega pi method, we're then able to chain and throw onto this. And we pass in the string or the object that's representing our error. And then what we're able to do is we can uh, just expect that the pseudo big pi method will be called. And so this again is going to be functionally equivalent to how our spec does it. And so I want to point you in the direction of some resources. If this is something that uh, you know sounds interesting, I would say you know give it a shot, uh, jump in there and start playing around with it. So there's actually some really great documentation. Um, it's up on GitHub. It's uh, pivotal.github.com slash jasmine. And this is a full set of documentation and examples that shows you how to write your Jasmine test. And again, if you're familiar with our spec and you're using that already, uh, this is going to be a really smooth transition for you. Uh, you can check out actually my homepage, chrisjpowers.com. Um, I have a lot of links and notes and uh, things about Jasmine and other JavaScript TV topics. So you can take a look at that. Also, um, a project that I'm working on, JavaScriptMasters.com, is not quite ready to go yet, but it's going to be a, uh, a set of resources for JavaScript specific. Um, we're going to be doing screencasts, tutorials, etc. And so if you go to JavaScriptMasters.com, uh, just give us the uh, your email and use the sign-up code ROA2011, and we'll make sure that uh, we send some free stuff your way, uh, a free uh, tutorial uh, that goes more in depth than I did here tonight um, about how you can start using Jasmine. So if you have questions, uh, we've got some time now, and you can always hit me up on Twitter. I'd be more than happy to uh, talk shop. And also, if you have any feedback, uh, let me know. I'd like to hear what you thought about the talk on, uh, on uh, the speakerrate.com. I'll uh, tweet that link as well. Yes? Um, so the, uh, the idea is that, uh, hypothetically speaking, if in the implementation code, um, oh, thank you. Uh, so to repeat the question, he was just asking, um, in this test, you know, we're, we're making reference to the pseudo bank pi method. How is that actually, or how would that actually get called that I'd be, you know, expecting it to be called? And I guess the, uh, the idea was that um, if I've put in some error handling code to catch this error or make your own damn pie. And then in, in that handling code, rather than quitting the program, I'm actually then going to run the pseudo fake pie uh, in order to try to get, you know. Right, Oh, you know what? You are absolutely right. Sorry about that. I'm missing uh, the last line should actually um, do something like, I think I was using cook dot make dinner. So, oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, you're right. I, I was missing a line of code here. So imagine cook.make dinner is at the bottom there. And that would have been the, uh, the method that we're actually running in the test. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Anyone else have any questions about uh, PDD JavaScript? Background? Chris? Yes. H have you seen Evergreen at all for integrating Jasmine with Rails? Uh, the question was if I've seen Evergreen, and unfortunately, no, I'm not familiar with that. What is that? Um, it's just another way to integrate Jasmine with Rails instead of depending on our spec. Does it give you a like a different kind of runner, or? Uh, it uses Selenium by default, but it uses mm -hmm. Kappa Byron under the hood as well. Okay. So. All right. So I'm also wrote Kappa Byron also wrote Evergreen. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like Evergreen is also a uh, another framework to uh, keep under radar. So it sounds like a cool project using Kappa Byron. Yes. If your JavaScript code includes references to things like buttons and links uh, in the window, can you trigger events at, on those, on those <coughs> objects in the context of your, of your sure. testing? Yeah, so the question was, um, 
Assuming that your JavaScript code is going to have a lot of references to DOM elements, buttons, links, things that you're going to be clicking, and that you're going to be putting uh, event handlers on, you know, how, how exactly does that work, and how do we have access to those objects? Um, so there's, there's a few things. First of all, if you're using jQuery, um, there's actually a jQuery Jasmine uh, library that you can kind of mix into uh, your current test code, and it gives you a lot of helper methods that allow you to do stuff like this. And so a common usage pattern, um, I would say there's, there's probably two common usage patterns. Uh, the first one is that you would um, create elements in the DOM um, using jQuery, like in a before each block, for example. And so let's say that you have a describe block where you're describing a form functionality, and you have some kind of an AJAX call or some, some kind of a uh, a click handler on the button. So what I would do is I would, I would basically uh, figure out which of the keynotes, well I need a form with a certain ID, I need a button in there with a certain ID. And using uh, some of the methods in jQuery, I would actually create those, um, those DOM elements. And you can attach them to the document. Or you don't have to. Um, when possible, I like to just keep my DOM elements you know, they exist, but they're not actually on the page. Tests run faster, you don't have conflicts of things bumping into each other. Um, the other thing that you can do that uh, is the fixtures. So if you have, um, you know, markup that is either generated from your RSpec code and you want to use, or it's just markup that you, you know, it's your fixture markup, um, you can create an HTML file, and then the jQuery, um, the jQuery Jasmine library gives you helpers to very easily load that in, put it in the DOM, and now you can start simulating clicks and uh, doing all that stuff so that you can uh, fully test all of your uh, interactive behavior. Yes? Chris, do you like to um, test AJAX calls using the spy function, or is there some other approach that you use? Um, I would say that um, usually uh, I treat it the same way I treat like RSpec kind of hitting external resources or, um, you know, like I, I'll stub out the, um, or yeah, basically use a spy to make sure that the call is being made. And then in another test, I'll be calling the, the different callbacks, the error callback or the success callback um, with simulated responses um, so that you're not actually, you know, hitting any external resources in the test kit. Um, and I know that there's some, I've seen some different helper libraries that I don't have much experience with, but um, there, there is built-in support for testing asynchronous code um, in, in Jasmine. And there is more extensions that I've seen on GitHub for people creating these helpers to allow them to uh, better, more easily spec out AJAX calls um, and other asynchronous behavior. Yes? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, it's pretty much all just kind of in, uh, in, in the before blocks. Um, and like I said, any time that you create a, a variable um, that you're going to be using inside your tests, inside more than one test, I should say, those all kind of get declared at your highest scope. You usually have like a var statement at the top of the page with all the variables you're going to be using, um, just so that they're all declared at the, at the top of the scope. Um, but yeah, in terms of some of the semantics of using subject and let, I haven't seen an equivalent to that uh, in the, the jazz. Yes? I know it's a whole nother talk, but headless JavaScript testing, your favorite tool? Um, well, I, I mean, I really use Jasmine CI. Um, and uh, it does, it uses some kind of a headless Firefox, something or other in the background. Um, you know, I actually, I really do like using the Jasmine test in the browser, uh, just because I find that it suits my workflow pretty well. Um, they tend to be very fast, and um, I've had, I just generally say I've had more luck doing that. But um, you know, the CI stuff I've plugged into our Hudson server, and you know, that always works well. But I'm, I'm very excited to see some more mature implementations of uh, doing the headless browser testing. 